Good day, folks, and welcome back to the channel. Well, maybe you can help me with this. A Filipino polo knife from the Insurrection War. I don't know too much about it. It's got an original label here by whoever captured it, stating where this was found and who it was given to. That's pretty cool. I figured a thousand bucks, man. There's no comparables out there. All right, I'll give you 600 bucks for it. All right, man, you're tough. You're tough, man. What's this? A Philippine war knife? I bought it from Spencer. What'd you pay for it? 600. Chill, this is worth like maybe 200 bucks. 200 plus about 800. I know it's not worth that. I'll bet you that I'm right. I know I'm right. I bet you it's worth $600 or more. And if I'm right, you're walking pinky in a tutu. Cool. And if I'm right, you're cutting your ponytail off with this thing. It's worth about 300 bucks, right? These are actually really popular with collectors. This little label here, the 26th Infantry Regiment. So this is a, a legendary infantry regiment. This early date, 1899, I mean, this could have been one of their first battles ever. But with this and tied to the 26th Infantry Regiment, I think it's like, you probably get a thousand bucks for it. Boom. Damn it. Here are times when the biggest mistakes were made on Pawn Stars. This is absolutely great. This is really cool. When I was a kid, I love Donald Duck. I thought he was absolutely amazing. Is that why you're grumpy all the time? Yeah, so this is Shelby. They started in the 1890s. The owner had a brilliant idea. He made a bicycle that was modeled after Lindbergh, and this was their biggest seller. The tank needs to be restored because the colors are all screwed up there. We have to get um, the rear taillight re-chromed. And Donald Duck's face, I don't know if that's actually cracked or that's paint. I like to think of that more as a quack. OK. Can you do 2400 2250 And I'm crazy at that price. I'm going to walk at that price. I mean, I really can't go anymore. OK. I'll take that. All right, 2250, we got a deal. Hey, Rick, <laughs> how you doing? That's what I called you about. Very cool, Shelby bike, Donald Duck. Give Donald some plastic surgery and uh, weld up his face. Uh, then I'd work on that tank. And I want it to quack again. Probably have to rewire it, probably have to clean up the battery box, get the lights working, and then you'll be set to go. Well, I got some bad news. It's not a true Donald, it's a clone. It's a fake Donald Duck bite? Who fakes a Donald Duck bite? Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Rick's adoration for the children's movie Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory caused him to make one of the costliest mistakes ever. When he got a chance to purchase props from the famous movie, he acts unlike himself. Rick was already giddy with excitement by the time he knocked on the client's front door. Dan warns Rick that the cost of breaking up his extensive collection will be very dear. Rick is so astonished by the props that he cannot decide what to buy. Bird told me you had some uh, Willy Wonka stuff. Some props from the original film. Why are you a fan? Make a wish, count to three, <laughs> and I'll be right back. Voila. Wow. Is that the hat? This is the original hat that Gene Wilder wore in the original film. Is that insane? Looking pretty stylish. <laughs> <laughs> this is the golden egg. It's heavy. OK. And a golden ticket? A genuine screen used. Golden ticket. <sighs> and to boot, Wonka bars. Those ones they used on the set? Yeah, and they still haven't melted. Well, they're props made of wood. Yeah. So where'd you get all this stuff? We bought it at auction. That's amazing. And what is that? What would you want it to be? Oh my god. That's I, the real deal? I don't know, is it? Is it the everlasting gobstopper? Yeah. That's I, the real deal? I'm even getting chills holding it. Eventually, he buys the everlasting gobstopper and the Wonka bar for $105,000. If only he'd known that this would turn out to be a silliest mistake. It's like the Hope Diamond. But yeah, that's like the Holy Grail. When I was seven years old, that's the one thing I remember was the everlasting gobstopper. It just sounded like the most amazing thing in the world. Yeah, that was the centerpiece of the whole film. It's crazy, too, because the movie was a flop. The 80s came out and video came out. It just turned into, like, the greatest thing ever. How much do you want for the gobstopper? Gosh. That is the centerpiece of the film, which if we sell that, that's definitely breaking up the aesthetics of the whole collection. So I'm going to give you one price, and that's that. I, I got to stick with $100,000 for the Gobstopper. He may have walked out before paying a penny. The props turned out to be worth at most $40,000. It was your favorite film. If you throw in a Wonka bar. And that's breaking up the set, though. I'll tell you what, I would give you one Wonka bar and I'd give you the Everlasting Gobstopper for 115000 But you can do it for 100000 No. All right, so $105,000, and I get a Wonka bar. I'm going to miss that Everlasting Gobstopper. Sweet! You got a deal. I'm seven years old again. <laughs> Renee Magritte. When presented with an alleged original Renee Magritte painting, Rick calls his art expert, Chad Sampson, to authenticate the piece. So I have a customer in the store with a painting that he says is painted by Rene Magritte. Called him my art guy. I'm going to have him take a look. I got my fingers crossed. Here we go. Wow. Rene Magritte. It's an amazing painting. First off, 
Rene Magritte was one of the founders of the Surrealist movement. He's from Belgium. From there, he went to Paris. This is the place to be. He hooks up with Picasso. At that point, he's not doing very well at all. He starts doing a lot of knockoffs. So there's a lot of people in the world with a Picasso that's fake, but it's a real Magritte. Chad tells him that Magritte fell into hard times and made money forging the works of more successful artists like Picasso. Chad notes that though the signature is perfect, it can only be authenticated by the Rene Magritte committee in Belgium. So, how do you feel about it? It looks very good. This is a very early painting. You can tell just by the smoke damage that's on it. This hung for a very long time somewhere. The painting style is very, very him. The signature is perfect. It's always a risk. Forgers aren't stupid. So what do you think? The bad news is my opinion means nothing. The only opinion that matters is the Rene Magritte committee in Belgium. You have to take it unframed to Belgium. So what's it worth? This painting has two states of being. One state of being, it's worth nothing. The other state of being, this is a seven, dollars $800,000 painting. But the market is moving very, very quickly. A piece that was worth $800,000 20 years ago is worth $3.8 million now. Cool. Thanks, man. Chad tells Rick that if authentic, the painting is worth $800,000, and if fake, it is worthless. Rick offers the client two options. $10,000 on the spot before authentication, or $500,000 after Rick sends the painting to Belgium for authentication. There's a few different things I could do for you. I'll give you 10 grand and I'll take all the risks. Or I will spend all my money and I'll take it to Belgium. I'll do everything for it. If it turns out it's real, I'll give you 400 grand. I'm straight up gambling here. And if it's fake, I lose all the money. I think I'll do the 10 grand. We got a deal. Thanks. When Rick heads to Belgium to receive the artwork and letter confirming that the painting is authentic, Chum Lee tags along. The two sit on a park bench to read the committee's letter. Rick is disappointed to find out that the painting is not authentic. Not only did he waste $10,000, he also lost more during the authentication process. Chum and I are here in Belgium, waiting on the verdict from the Magritte. Hopefully, they'll verify it as real. Oh my god, that took forever. Is it real? I don't know. They hand me this, they hand me the a letter. I'm gonna go sit down in the park and read this letter. All right, Rick, you ready to see what $10 million looks like one more time? Dear Richard Harrison, the committee met yesterday and is of the opinion that the work presented is not a work by Rene Marguerite. Thank you. So what do you think that means? That means it's not real. I had my doubts, Rick. Would you like me to point them out to you? Not funny. I'll give you a hundred bucks for it. No. Filipino Insurrection Bolo Knife. Rick's buddy comes in to sell a Filipino Insurrection Bolo Knife that he got from a Virginia estate sale. He asks Chum Lee for $1,000 for the knife. Chum Lee inspects the knife and is impressed to see that it has an engraved plate describing when, where, and by whom the knife was won. Well, maybe you can help me with this. A Filipino bolo knife from the Insurrection War. All right. Normally, I'd call Rick, but he really doesn't want me bugging him right now. I don't know too much about it. Because it's got an original label here by whoever captured it, stating where this was found and who it was given to. That's pretty cool. I figured a thousand bucks, man. There's no comparables out there. I'm guessing it's probably some worth somewhere in maybe like the $500 range. Eight fifty. dollars 500 that's the most I'm going to give you. 600 bucks. that's it. I'm walking. All right, I'll give you 600 for it. All right, man, you're tough. You're tough, man. Chum Lee confesses that he does not know much about the knife, but proceeds to negotiate without calling in an expert. After brief negotiations, Chum Lee buys the knife for $600. Corey is furious to hear that Chum bought the knife for $600 because he believes it to be worth no more than $300. Chum and Corey make a bet on who's wrong. Corey agrees to wear a tutu and walk Chum's dog if he loses, and Chum agrees to chop off his ponytail. What's this? A Philippine war knife? I bought it from Spencer. What'd you pay for it? 600. Chum, this is worth like maybe 200 bucks. 200 plus about 800. I know it's not worth that. I'll bet you. That I'm right? I know I'm right. I bet you it's worth $600 or more. And if I'm right, you're walking pinky in a tutu. Cool. And if I'm right, you're cutting your ponytail off with this thing. But I'll accept that bet because I know I'm right. Yeah, I, there's no way I'm wrong. You're gonna be losing your hair, man. Hope they got a tutu in his size. Unfortunately for Corey, the expert agrees with Chum Lee. At the end of the episode, Corey and the cute dog don pink tutus and take a walk as Chum records it all. Rick and Chum savagely laugh at his humiliation. 
Check out this score I've got. Me and Shum have a bet. What's it worth? It's worth about 300 bucks, right? These are actually really popular with collectors. There's this little label here, the 26th Infantry Regiment. So this is a, a legendary infantry regiment. This early date, 1899, I mean, this could have been one of their first battles ever. But with this, and tied to the 26th Infantry Regiment, I think it's like, you probably get a thousand bucks for it. Boom! Oh, damn it. Come on, let's get this over with. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wait, turn around, let me get a picture of you guys. <laughs> I'm done now. I can't believe you gotta be aware of that. I will it's never forgive best. you for this, chum. Jimi Hendrix's guitar. David, a slender, long-haired rock and roll type dude, offers Rick a guitar he claimed belonged to Jimi Hendrix. As always, Rick checked out the guitar and then called in an expert to authenticate it and confirm it is worth the $750,000 that David wants for it. So, what do we got here? I think there's something in here you're really gonna like to see. Okay. 1963, American-made Fender Stratocaster. Oh, to me, this is the guitar. There's something very, very special about this specific guitar. This guitar was actually played by Jimi Hendrix. Okay, you mind if I pick it up? No, absolutely, by all means. All right. This is the holy grail. He actually held this guitar that you now have in your hands and made wonderful music with it. Is there any pictures of him playing it on stage or anything? Or No, because he, it was exclusively played in the studio. This was his really favorite sort of recording acts. I'm going to set this down. <laughs> <laughs> Rick's expert, Jesse Amoroso, takes on the task of assuring him that the 1963 Fender Stratocaster was genuine and could have belonged to the legend Jimi Hendrix. And where did you get this? It was actually owned by a guy named Skip Jarrett. There was a, a studio called Juggy Sound Studio that Jimmy loved to cut in okay. up in New York. Skip was the chief engineer at Juggy Sound Studio. And after they wrapped up all the production on Band of Gypsies and all that, they gave this guitar to Skip. When he passed away, one of my business associates and I acquired the guitar. Plus I have, you know, a letter signed by Jimmy's brother. I have seen where people had letters from the family. Right, right, okay. okay and it okay. turned out not to be what they said it was. Right. That's the one big thing that scares me. How much do you want for the guitar? I'd be willing to take, say, 750000 for it. I have a friend who, if this thing is real, he will know. And if not, he'll call bull****. All right, I'll be right back. Give me awesome. a few minutes. Okay, thanks, man. Jesse drools over the guitar and declares it at worth at least $35,000 without the Jimi Hendrix connection. Jesse values the guitar at $750,000 to a million dollars after using dents caused by Jimi Hendrix's unique style of playing to verify its identity. This is stupid cool. I mean, <laughs> Jimmy's one of Jimmy's guitars. I want to make sure this is 100% before we start talking a lot of money. You mind if I take a look at it? By all means, that's why you're awesome. here. The tremolo bar. These are usually bent and angled up. You play the guitar upside down. He flattened a lot of these out made straight. Another thing is what they call ring wear. If you're playing the guitar like this, my wedding ring hits the guitar, removes a lot of the paint. If you look at this guitar, the top side of the neck has a lot of that wear. That's from the guitar being this way. Uh, Jimmy would have played it. This serial number here, this guitar has actually been documented. No doubt, this is definitely one of Jimmy's guitars. In my head, I think I know what it's worth, but what do you think? Anywhere from 750 to good auction million. Rick tries to lowball David with $450,000, $500,000, and eventually $550,000. Even a last-ditch $600,000 offer did not tempt David. Nothing less than the $750,000 was good enough for David. Rick makes the regrettable mistake of allowing the hallowed guitar to slip through his fingers. Jesse took advantage of this and brought the guitar to sell at a shop. Let me give you $450,000. $450,000? For a guitar that could fetch maybe a million dollars on any day, your guy, own guy just told you that. Okay, but what uh, we Come on, four hundred and fifty grand. Yeah, I'm thinking seven fifty, dollars man. I'll give you half a million. This guitar's worth more than that. If you want the money now, I can go five fifty. dollars Knowing that it could potentially fetch a million dollars at an auction, I can't leave that much money on the table. Uh, seven fifty, dollars really, man. That's a, that's a bottom dollar I can take for the guitar. Hey, okay, well, have a nice day. Tell me if it goes to auction, I might bid on it. <sighs> Thanks, man. Well... Six? I can't do it, man. But I'll call you if I change my mind. Willie Mays Baseball Uniform Corey remains doubtful when a customer offers him a well-preserved baseball uniform that allegedly belonged to Willie Mays. Only after an expert inspects the immaculate white uniform 
and confirms that it was an original that was issued to Willie Mays, does Corey seem interested in buying it? Hey, I got this 61 uh, Willie Mays uniform. I got this jersey with the matching pants underneath. You're bringing me in something here that's amazing. The home runs this guy could have hit in this uniform, the bases he stole. Which I'm sure he did in this uniform. It's pretty amazing. Where'd you come across this? It's a family heirloom. My, my uncle acquired it in the late 60s, and when he passed away, my aunt just kept good care of it. And about two and a half years ago, she was nice enough to give it to me. This is amazing, man. I mean, there's very few guys in the world that can compare to him in that sport. Corey pays a steep $31,000 for the rare vintage sports collectible, only to later find out that it was a salesman sample. What do we got? Check it out, it's a Willie Mays uniform. What concerns did you have with it? How do we prove that it was actually game worn? It was Willie Mays's. The most important thing when analyzing jerseys from this era is gonna be the tags and any kind of markings on the jersey. Willie Mays 61 where it's stitched in black. Now, Spalding is a company that the Giants contracted, and seeing this is consistent with a lot of Spalding jerseys from this time period. One thing I'm just not seeing is any damage to it. This thing appears to be in immaculate condition, especially for its age, which leads me to believe that it's game issued versus game used. Now, although we can't prove that this is actually a game worn jersey, this is 100% authentic jersey that Willie Mays was issued. Great, good to hear. The uniform had been issued to a salesman and not to Willie Mays. He was gutted to learn that the uniform was not worth anywhere near the $31,000 that he had paid for it. How much are you looking to get out of it? I'd like to get $45,000. And I'd like to be able to make some money. I'll give you twenty grand for it. Yeah, I can't. Did you uh, do forty? I'll go about $22,000. I think we should be able to do better than that. Thirty-seven. dollars Go $25,000. i am not going any higher. You do thirty-five? dollars Nope. I'm sorry. I don't think I'll be able to do that. Thirty grand. This is the best I can do. Can you meet me at thirty-three? Thirty-one thousand dollars. Call it a day. Sounds good. All right. Nineteen forty-nine. Shelby Donald Duck buy. Rick makes yet another regrettable deal when he hurriedly purchases a nineteen forty-nine Shelby Donald Duck bike. Despite the seller admitting that he bought the bike online, Rick ignores the huge red flags and delights in inspecting the bike. Oh yeah, my boss is gonna love this. Come with me. All right. Hey Rick. This is absolutely great. This is really cool. When I was a kid. I love Donald Duck. I thought he was absolutely amazing. Is that why you're grumpy all the time? Yeah, so this is Shelby. They started in the 1890s. The owner had a brilliant idea. He made a bicycle that was modeled after Lindbergh, and this was their biggest seller. The tank needs to be restored because the colors are all screwed up there. You have to get um, the rear taillight rechromed. And Donald Duck's face, I don't know if that's actually cracked or that's paint. I like to think of that more as a quack. Okay. There's a battery pack in there. I guarantee you everything's corroded and needs to be fixed. How much do you want for it? I'd like to get 3000 for it. After cheering some Donald Duck jokes, Rick gets serious when the seller quotes a $3,000 asking price. He complains that the bike will need serious restoration before being put up for sale. Though the seller tries holding his ground at $3,000, he drives a tough bargain and eventually accepts $2,250, much higher than Rick's original $1,500 offer. I'll give you $1,500. No, I don't think I can do that. What's the best you can do? I do $2,800. $2,000? You do $2,400. $2,250, and I'm crazy at that price. I'm gonna walk at that price. I mean, I really can't go anymore. Okay, I'll take that. All right, $2,250, we got a deal? Rick rushes the bike to Bob Juhas, the restoration expert, and pays $350 for the repairs. Hey, Rick, <laughs> how you doing? That's what I called you about. Very cool, Shelby bike, Donald Duck. Give Donald some plastic surgery and uh, weld up his face. Uh, then I'd work on that tank. And I want it to quack again. Probably have to rewire it, probably have to clean up the battery box, get the lights working, and then you'll be set to go. So how much? I'm feeling 350. Well, that'll be amazing. And if it's really pretty, I'll get four or 5,000 out of this, right? All right, cool, so I can pick it up tomorrow? Give me about a week. Unfortunately for him, Bob returns the bike with some terrible news. After learning the bike is fake and barely worth $1,000, Rick is sick with disappointment. He cannot believe people fake innocuous items like Donald Duck bikes. Chum, what's up? Check this out. Rick, you never told me you were getting this thing fixed up. Did you get the horn to work? Of course. What about the eyes? Do they light up? Kind of looks evil with the eyes lit. Well, I got some bad news. It's not a true Donald, it's a clone. It's a fake Donald Duck bike? If you look underneath, you'll find the serial number. And it says Shelby Co., but it also the first two numbers are 53. 1953. Shelby only made this bike in 1949. Who fakes a Donald Duck bike? I've been in this business for over 30 years. I have never, ever heard of a fake Donald Duck bike. This is where we'll end our video. We hope you enjoyed watching it. Make sure to comment, hit that like and subscribe button too. Hit that notification bell for more videos like this. Share this video with your family and friends. See you soon.